Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event to celebrate the publication of this new book by our colleague uh, Gil Hochberg, who has actually brought so much to so many of our intellectual worlds here at Columbia. So welcome to our Zoom audience and the speakers for this panel. I'm uh, Laila Abulogod from the Department of Anthropology and the Institute for the Study of Sexuality and Gender at Columbia and actually most relevant for my privilege of sharing, chairing this event. Um, I'm a faculty, fellow faculty member with Gil at uh, Columbia's Center for Palestine Studies. And this event that's part of a series um, at the Society of Fellows and Hyman Center for the Humanities to celebrate new work by faculty in the arts and sciences is co-sponsored by the um, Office of the Divisional Deans, the Middle East Institute, and the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. Uh, so thanks to all, and thanks to Kay Zhang, who behind the scenes is making all this happen. Uh, and I have to start by you know talking myself. Uh, I shouldn't. I have to say that this is a book that has already taught me so much, uh, pushed me to think about archives in new ways. And what I'm most grateful for um, has led me to appreciate the work of edgy, talented, thoughtful Palestinian artists, filmmakers, dancers, and activists who are pushing the limits, I think, of art and imagination. And I'm someone who tends to be prosaic in my media and art tastes, having chosen to do my own media study on television, on television dra melodramas. Uh, but Gil is such an insightful um, guide that she op opened up these works and artists to me and will to you. Uh, artists and works that I had either not known about or had, had didn't have the imagination to be able to appreciate. So uh, like many, I thought of archives um, as sources for the past, but what Gil shows us is how archives can be used to break from the past and to imagine futures beyond present realities. And these realities are pretty tough for Palestinians. Um, but I also had the incredible experience of being part of a small group of scholars that Gil invited to workshop a draft of this book manuscript. And besides remembering how hard she made me think uh, and the new world she opened up for all of us, I'll never forget the grace, the openness, the honesty with which she welcomed <laughs> new perspectives and even criticism uh, and how well she articulated uh, what she was trying to do, it was really a model for me uh, that I, I could never achieve, but uh, I will never forget it. Um, but as I was reading the acknowledgments of Becoming Palestine, the book that came out, I also noticed um, something else that many of us who know her appreciate even more than these qualities. Uh, so besides the theoretical vision, her interpretive sharpness about cultural and artistic production and politics, she has a sense of humor. Uh, and in the last sentence of the acknowledgement, she thanks her kids saying, I thank you both for reminding me time and again that my books are boring. It helps lower expectations. <laughs> well, I can tell you uh, this book is anything but boring. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing Gil and the panelists talk today uh, about how wrong her kids are. Um, so I hope they're listening. Uh, the format of these book celebrations is pretty standard. Gil will open up with, um, I don't know, five, 10 minutes of uh, words. Then each of the panelists has about eight minutes for their remarks. Uh, Gil will then respond to these and then we'll take questions from the audience and you should be sure to put your questions um, in the Q&A, not in the chat, uh, at the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and I'll do my best to share with Gil and the others what we have time for at the end. Uh, but I'm also going to break a little bit from tradition. We were talking about Zoom fatigue um, and uh, break it up a bit. Um, introduce Gil, let her speak before I introduce our guest panelists. Um, so Gil Hochberg is Ransford Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature and Middle East Studies at Columbia and is also the chair of uh, MISAS, the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies. Her first book was In Spite of Partition, Jews, Arabs and the Limits of Separatist Imagination. Um, 
Her second book, Visual Occupations, Vision and Visibility in a Conflict Zone, was an uh, amazing study of visual politics of the Israeli-Palestinian terrain of conflict. And Becoming Palestine is her latest book. And I think if you look at the back of my screen, I have it propped up there on my desk. Uh, her latest book, and we'll be putting um, in the chat uh, ways that you can buy the book. When we used to meet in what I understand the youth call IRL in real life, um, for these events, we had a table outside the room where you could buy the book and hold it immediately in your hands. But here we are in this new age. So uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Gil, now, uh, and then come in when you've finished and introduce the others. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Laila, uh, for these really exceptionally kind words. Um, I almost moved into tears. Uh, it's um, really moving to me. Thank you uh, for all of the panelists. Thank you for um, all of the people in the um, um, Heyman Center for working behind the scenes and making it possible. And for all of the people in the audience, I hope we get a chance to hear from you in the Q&A. Um, so because my time is limited to eight minutes, I'll um, dive right in it and I'll do my best. Um, it is really a task to shrink a five-year work process into eight minutes, but um, you know, I'll, I'll uh, do as best as I can. Um, so the thing I would like to start with is the opening sentence uh, in the preface to the book, because I think it, it really sort of underlines the most important aspect of the book. Um, I read, The Coming Palestine is a book about archival imagination of and for the future. So what I mean by this um, is two things that I think sort of... Uh, mark the, the significance of, of the book as a project that maybe is um, you know, different than many other projects about, um, about archives and particularly in context of Palestine. The first is temporal, and um, I think it's, it's uh, something that will come up. It came up in Lila's comments, but I'm sure it's, it's something that will come up. Um, so what I mean by this is that um, mostly what is written about archives in general, and certainly in the context of Palestine, um, it has to be, has a, normally attends to um, the past and it's a past oriented uh, investigation with archives addressed and approached as a gateway to the past, as a means of discovering historical details, discovering facts and proof, so to speak, for past events, say, crimes, war crimes, atrocities, state violence, et cetera. Um, Becoming Palestine's, Palestine, the book, um, advances a, what I call a time bending maneuver, by which I mean that my call is to engage the archive, both specific archives, uh, but also the theoretical concept of the archive itself as a gateway to the future. So if I had to choose the main argument of the book, uh, I would say that it is that there remains little, if anything, redemptive to be found in the archive as a source of historical knowledge, if we think about it in terms of political and ethical engagement. And I make this argument as a general claim or position, but I account for it specifically in the case of Palestine in which I argue that the role of discovery, whether of new facts, new documents, past atrocities, or the celebration, momentarily celebrations of the opening of the Israeli state archive, opening, closing, opening, closing, and the kind of new uh, information that is leaked out. What I suggest is that the celebratory momentary discovery is quick to fade out and it creates little, as we've seen so far, little if any political impact. And this not because facts in themselves do not translate into anything important, but they do not translate into an ethical or political position of change. In the context of Palestine, I think this is specifically true because I think we are subjected in this context to what I call archival fatigue. 
And this, uh, again, is not because the facts don't matter, but because the actual performance of discovery, discovering time and time again, the same information in new incarnation actually is lost to a mechanism of repetition compulsion. Because what the archives reveal is what we always already know. The impact of the accumulating moments of such discoveries, these aha moments, end up being, I, I argue, both politically and ethically numbing. So while someone like Laura Kong writes about the undemocratic character of the historical archive, or somebody who is very important for me in her work, Saidia Hartman, underlines the importance of critical fabulations as a means of overcoming violence and erasure of the historical archive, I shift attention to a different approach, not necessarily negating, but a different approach. What I suggest is that what we need to learn to do is change the temporality of the archive so that we learn to read our own living present as an archive, and not just as an archive that is filled with traces or hidden moments of erased past, but more significantly, with hidden traces of a potential future or futures. Hidden futures, hidden potentialities. The, a future that all, the futures that the archive as an order of things to use Foucault's term or the conditions of the possible to use Ariela Azulay's terms make it impossible for us to see or imagine. So that was the first thing I wanted to answer, uh, uh, mention, which is the temporality. The second that I would like to highlight um, about uh, the endeavor of this book is that um, while in the context of Palestine and, and broader uh, to that, the, the sort of long uh, a critical engagement with archives has been for a long time dedicated to different approaches of reading official archives, readings and unreadings, either against the grain or along the grain, to use Anne Stoller's famous term. What I'm suggesting is that at this point, we need to do something else, which is simply to give less authoritative power to these archives mm -hmm. and instead take significantly more seriously alternative minor archives, refugee archives, diasporic, feminist, queer, and all kinds of artistic endeavors that do not take the state power as their point of departure. I say this because we live in an archive saturated era. We live in a digi digital world. And so the archive de facto is no longer truly centralized and while there is still, of course, a question of state censorship, and of course, there is still um, the question of, um, um, of some people having access to archive material while others don't, I still argue that the question of censorship and state authority should not continue to be the main question that we fixate on when we talk about archives today. And I mentioned this in the book, I give a whole um, sort of account of the history of the theoretical encounter with the archive. And I suggest that um, um, it, it's, it's sort of uh, not in correlation with the reality of how archival material actually circulates today. Um, and so uh, what I suggest is that we find um, that it is in these alternative archives that we can find expression for, for, for future aspirations and solidarities. And it is wrong to continue to look exclusively or even primarily or to privilege official state archive or in the case of Palestine, almost uh, bitterly ironic, uh, ironical, the IDF archive, because the IDF archive has also consecrated all of the Palestinian archives through uh, the Lebanon, um, the first war in Lebanon in 1982, the PLO archive of uh, uh, film, photography, etc., and many other archives. There's something very um, sad, almost very uncomfortable for me happens is that when you see say alternative films, for example, um, 
uh, Maya Silla's film uh, that is all about uh, these conspicated, conspicated uh, uh, archival Palestinian materials. At the end, there is always, and thank you to the IDF, because that is the source, that's the archive. So while these are important sources of archival information, in many ways, I think we actually do not need to be reliant on them. There are alternative and plural archives. And if we emphasize, as I do, the importance of speculative and time travel orientation, if we respect rather than suspect the counterfactual, the virtual and the yet unattainable, all of which are properties of art as a source of alternative archival knowledge and imagination, we will find a vast archive, a vast Palestinian archive, in fact. And this brings me to the third and the last aspect of the project that I wanna to share today, which is the significance of art. So the book uh, engages, as Laila suggested, with uh, Palestinian art, with artistic expressions. There are chapters dedicated to essay films, to dance, to literature, to conceptual art, to photography. Um, I also do uh, want to note that um, there is a, I guess I'm trying to think how Lila said it, it was, uh, it was uh, a, kind of a, a nice way of saying that it's art that is uh, more cutting edge, but what I mean by it is that these are uh, young artists, and I think it's important, I mentioned it in the book about some kind of a generational uh, break that we can talk about perhaps in Q&A, but what I suggest is that these artworks um, actually directly engage with either specific archives. And interestingly, some of these are um, um, Israeli archives, whether cinematic or others, um, but they engage either with specific archives or with the concept of the archives in activating way in experimental, specifically mischievous and irreverent ways. Uh, and I su suggest that it is this, uh, modality that actually achieves a liberation of archival imaginations from the grip of history. This is what brings me to this term becoming, which I take from uh, Gilles Deleuze, um, becoming Palestine. So for Deleuze, and I follow him in the sense, becoming itself requires a certain leaving behind of given conditions or a certain leaving behind of what it is that makes the present as we see it or first uh, realize it. Uh, for Deleuze, the poetic political intervention of art suggests something very different than history because it breaks the teleology of history. In this sense, art offers a relative freedom that makes the present less recognizable. What is important about this and important for me to emphasize is that it is not some kind of an academic Deleuzean uh, high theory uh, modality that I'm suggesting here, but following the artists that I examine, actually an urgent political matter. Remember that we are told time and again by some that we all must be serious, serious people, responsible. We must think historically because imagination is for children. I want to suggest that the truth is, it's not my own suggested, that any important political movement we've ever experienced historically, any influential one, whether we like it or not, and Zionism is a prime example of that, is first and foremost a work of imagination. And art invites us to read the present as an archive of potentiality, as a process of becoming, to a still unknown present, a still unknown future. A future that is an act of, of active archival reimagination and citationality, to use Roland Barthes' terms. And so instead of looking at already existing political collectives as and facts, as we find in the archive, art has the potential to generate what Stefan Best has called the unknown us. My last words are just to say that the book really is a close engagement with contemporary artists, and I am in debt to them and their creative writing above all. So I just want to mention in brief a few names. 
uh, who have opened my world to alternative political imagination. So with the utmost uh, gratitude and respect, Jamana Mana, Basil Abbas, Ruan Abu Rahim, Emil Jazir, Steven uh, Sabella, Shuruk Harb, Kamil Al Jafari, Aza Al Hassam, Larissa Sansur, Farah Saleh, and Basma Al Sharif, among many others. Thank you. I'm very eager to hear others now. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to move. Uh, that was great. So uh, we're going to hear from the panelists who have come to join us uh, to talk about your book. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Gayatri Gokunath, uh, who could join us from NYU as our first respondent. And she's Associate Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis, and also the Director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at NYU, and best known, as her bio says, for Impossible Desires, Queer Diasporas and South Asian Public Cultures. But her recent book sounds to me uh, like it's very relevant to what you're talking about, Unruly Visions, the Aesthetic Practices of Queer Diaspora, um, Thinking About Archives, Aesthetics, and Affect. And I'm just going to introduce all the rest so that we can just move from one to the next. And next, we'll be hearing from Brian Larkin, my colleague in anthropology uh, at Barnard, whose research focuses on the uh, ethnography and history of media in Nigeria, and been especially influential uh, in thinking about infrastructures, but also the introduction of media technologies, um, cinema, radio, digital media. Uh, and his books include Signal and Noise, Media Infrastructure and Urban Culture in Nigeria, and I saw, remind, was reminded in the bio with myself and Faye Ginsberg, Media Worlds, Anthropology on New Terrain. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Debashri um, Mukherjee, who's assistant professor in Middle Eastern, South Asian, African Studies Department here. Uh, she's a specialist on South Asian cinema, cinema and media. Um, and I think with Brian Larkin, also a member of the Center for Comparative Media at Columbia, uh, which is a new and important um, uh, venture. She was trained as a filmmaker, worked in the Bombay's um, film and TV industries before turning to the Academy, and besides publishing in many academic journals and anthologies and editing a film journal, she's author uh, recently of a wonderful new book called Bombay Hustle best title ever, Making Movies uh, in a Colonial City. So um, I could say a lot more about each of them, but we want to hear from them uh, and about uh, becoming Palestine. So I'm going to turn it over to them, uh, to you, Gayatri, I think, first. Uh, and just one reminder, any of you who came in late uh, in the audience, we have, we will have we hope, time for questions from the audience uh, at the end, but you could start thinking about your questions and putting them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen anytime uh, so that we have a head start on um, what we're gonna talk about. So, and I'll do my best to share things at the end. So thank you. Go ahead, Guy. Thank you so much, Lila. And um, thank you, Gil, for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be a part of the celebration of Gil's beautiful and moving new book. Um, I realize I've known Gil uh, and have been reading and teaching her work for about 20 years now. And um, I've learned so much about from her about the politics of vision. And as Lila suggested, um, her book, Visual Occupations, really did inform my book, Unruly Visions, so I really thank her for that. So what becomes evident when I look at the arc of Gill's work is that she has a particular method that runs throughout her books. She's a master of clear and precise argumentation that she methodically layers and builds from one chapter to the next through stunning readings of different art practices. In fact, I use her work as a model for my graduate students to emulate as I find it paradigmatic of cultural studies scholarship at its finest. Gill's method, which I recognize from my own work, but which Gill does very well, masterfully I would say, is that she lets the artwork lead the way in determining her arguments and interventions. This to me is what sets Gill's work apart, the deep care and attention she pays to the artwork itself on its own terms, 
which in turn sets the terms of her argument. Gill opens her book by positioning herself as an archivist of sorts, and she invites the reader to see her book as creating an archive of decolonization. Indeed, Gill amasses for us a remarkable collection of what she terms artistic activations of the archive that spans different expressive cultures, from music to film, to mixed media installation, to photography, to performance. In this juxtaposition of texts and genres, we can understand Gill not only as an archivist, but as a curator as well. The Latin root of curation is curare, to care for. Thus, if we understand curation as the act of caring for, Gill's book evinces her deep care for the art object in situating it historically and in relation to other works, in thinking deeply about the work that it does in the world in relation to both time and space. This is, above all, a profoundly hopeful book. Gill brings her pessoptimist sensibility, which is a term I love, to bear on aesthetic practices that dare, dare to imagine otherwise, outside of, as she puts it, quote, predefined collectives configured in familiar political categories, end quote, such as the nation state, ethnicity, nativity, et cetera. Instead, Gill sees in these aesthetic practices and allows us to see how their engagements with the archive sketch the contours of what she terms new and still unrecognizable collectives of and for the future. The sense of hope in the book comes from Gill's belief in the possibility of the aesthetic as a site for disruption, for revisioning, and ultimately for imagining a future that goes beyond the colonial order of things. This is such a rich and suggestive book, so I'm going to limit, limit my comments to th three queries for Gill. First, one of Gill's central propositions is that we must move away from approaching the archive as a site of recovery, proof, originality, redemption. Rather, she argues that, quote, there's nothing left to find or prove. Archives hide very little, and the secrets of the archive are usually open secrets, and hence hardly secrets at all, end quote. Yet, yet I'm struck by Gil's reading in chapter two of Kamal Al-Jafari's 2015 film, Recollection, where she notes that, quote, every archive has its secrets and its ghosts. And while every archive exposes and hides, aiming to convince us that what we see, find, read is all there, the archive is always haunted, end quote. So I'm wondering how to reconcile a sense of the archive as an open secret with the notion of archives as in fact being inhabited by ghosts that lurk within what looked like a transparent rendering of the past as it really was. Al Jafari's film, as Gil shows beautifully, brings those hauntings in the official archive to light in order to disrupt the colonial order of things from within. So how then do we reconcile the apparent contradiction of the archive as an open secret with the archive as always harboring ghosts, what Toni Morrison would call the seething presence of unspeakable things unspoken? Second, Gill asserts that, quote, to move, away from wounded, to move away from wounded attachments, loss, and impossibility, and toward a politics invested in future potentiality is the ability to imagine otherwise, end quote. I absolutely concur with and find very powerful Gill's argument that we reject a politics grounded in nostalgia and instead turn our archival impulse towards future uh, potentialities that are open-ended and non-prescriptive. Yet in my own work, I found very useful the turn in the past decade or so towards negative affect in queer studies and the insistence by queer scholars on the world-making potential of loss, of melancholia, of shame and longing. I wonder, Gil, if you see any room for the productive potential of negative affect to open out into a non-triumphalist sociality and modes of relationality. And third, I'm struck by Gill's turn in the book to the sonic and to dance, gesture, and what Joseph Roach would term kinesthetic imagination. Indeed, a turn to the oral and to embodied practice bookend Becoming Palestine in the first and last chapters. Given that an engagement with visuality has always been so central to Gill's work, and necessarily so, 
given its centrality to settler colonial control, as she showed so beautifully and brilliantly in visual occupations. I wonder if Gill could comment on how a turn to the sonic and the kinesthetic in this book is perhaps her own gesture beyond the visual to other senses that perhaps open up new possibilities for futurity that we cannot get at through an engagement, however critical, with visuality. So finally, I want to end by offering up an image here of the 2017 installation, Temporal Twist, by Indian feminist artist, Shiva Chachi. Thank you. This is a work that I've been thinking and writing about for a while now, but Gill's book gives me a different entry into it. While Gill's thinking about the temporality of the archive is rooted in the specificity of Palestine, Israeli settler colonialism, and the Nakba, her insights have implications beyond the region and allow us to see other archival and nationalist projects anew. Temporal Twist was meant to commemorate the cataclysmic birth of another nation, another moment of trauma, rupture, and forced migration, the 1947 partition of the Indian subcontinent. Temporal Twist is monumental, a kinetic sculpture 26 feet high and eight feet wide made up of ribbons of 35 millimeter film that painstakingly twist into an hourglass shape and then back again. The installation suggests how our personal and collective memories are always and inevitably partial and mediated through various modes of visual representation. And Kay, if we can go to the next slide, please. Temporal twist is a model of how individual and collective memories function as damage negatives a kind of Mobius strip that distorts, contorts, bends, and refracts history across time and space. The twisted temporality of historical trauma, Chachi's work suggests, exceeds the boundaries of nation states and refuses linear trajectories of departure and arrival, exile and return. But if we bring Gill's framing of archival futurity to bear on Chachi's work, we see that it not only speaks to the violent past of the nation's birth that continues to haunt its present, but that the violence of diaspora, uprooting and displacement can perhaps lead us to a different historical imagination for the future. This is one that is not caught in nostalgia for an idealized past, but rather one that jettisons the very form and architecture of the nation state. And that instead, in Gill's words, embraces new and still unrecognizable collectives of and for the future. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you so much. That's amazing. Uh, okay, we're gonna move because we're falling behind already. Uh, so uh, Brian, I have you next. Uh, thanks very much. And um, Gil, thanks very much for this book. I, I really enjoyed it. I think it's an ex exquisite book. Sorry, something's gone wrong here. It's beautifully wrought. Um, I love the focus on appropriation, on using others' images against themselves. I enjoyed the turning and shaping of the idea of the archive. It's really quite a wonderful book to read on that level. And, and I found many of the arguments um, stimulating so much so that my few comments are just really jumping off or ideas provoked by the book rather than sort of a you know a full-on engagement with it in that sense and so you begin with this division between the speculative and the non-speculative archive the idea that the traditional archive um, focus on the past is exhausted of political potential secrets have been exposed but these archival efforts have resulted in little political change as you write and these are not even public secrets, because as Tausig would tell us, a public secret announces there is a secret. In here, you're saying it's just fully exposed. We know the violence. There is no surprise. It's a repetition of facts we know already. And I found this a really fairly compelling way to think of the present moment we're in. It, you know, obviously in the US, we can think of Trump standing up and saying, Russia, can you please find these emails? You know, you can think of him standing up and saying, you know, we're going to go down to the Congress and fight like hell. There's no secret here. There's no underneath of things to be revealed. The politics is all on the surface, and it really is the politics of the surface. Um, and so against this, you pose the necessity politically of speculative archives, of an archives oriented towards the future as opening up these questions of political possibility. 
So I really bought this argument and I found, and not just that, but you really go through, you know, a number of artists doing exactly this work and you show this. So it's very compelling in that argument. Um, but at the same time, it may be one that while we do live in this uh, world of a politics of the surface, we're also living in a world of an intense proliferation of conspiracy theories. Whether this is, you know, democratic pedophile circles in pizza parlors, whether it's, you know, Indian Muslims embarked on love jihads or, you know, cow sacrifice. Um, there is this underneath of things in this proliferation of um, conspiracies. And it made me wonder about the, the co-presence of very different sorts of politics in different ways. The different sorts of politics get enacted. And I was wondered then, I only made, you know, raised this, is do we have to see the traditional archive and its redemptive possibilities as exhausted or the way I would argue it is that it may be now there is no political possibility in that, but will that always be the case? And, and the reason I've been thinking about, about that is the work that's coming out from others in our department around issues of repair and reparations. You know, everyone knew the Berlin bronzes were taken by Britain. Everyone knew they were taken in conquest. There was no public secret about that. You know, they were taken, they were put in museums, but that public secret, for a long time had no political purchase, but now it does. You know, some artworks were returned this week. If we look at slavery, if we look at lynching, you know, lynching was a mass spectacle. It was photographed. Those photographs were turned into postcards that were circulated. There again was no hidden secret there. This is a violence that was publicly um, presented. And for the longest time had no political purchase in that sense. But now there might be. You know, now we can speculate about what made this political situation change. We can argue about whether it's successful or not, but there is a certain political possibility to questions of repair and reparation. So that in, in a sense, the future potential of speculative archives, could we grant that future potential to, and let's say the more traditional archive, that even if now it doesn't have that political purchase, could we see that there's two types of politics that might have possibility in the present uh, in the future so that was just one point and my only other point um which i found interesting was um I, I became interested in finding traces of the popular in the margins of the artworks that you were writing about and i wondered if in the popular there was a sort of unruly surfacing of the popular for one of another word a queering or unsettling to politics at the popular uh, brought into the regime of art per se. So in that sense, the speculative archival work you focus on is a self-reflexive, consciously political set of artworks. And each chapter really takes us through an incredible range, which is great to read. Um, but every now and again, there's a burst of the popular that seems not to be necessarily political as such, but seems to be political, but I'm uncertain as to the status of what politics it is. Um, and to give an example, in the film The White Elephant by the artist Shirok Harb, you talk about it's a film made from recycled video footage. These are a series of disparate images ripped from YouTube, from other online sources, bundled together, over which is laid the narration of a young Palestinian girl, uh, speaking of growing up as a teen in Ramallah and all the um, difficulties and pleasures involved in that. And so it's a taking of a certain set of images and it's recycling them and it's using them against themselves in a certain way. But there's that one point when the girl speaks of her love for the popular Israeli singer Dana International. And I think she mentions is either her or a sister, I cannot quite remember now, who begins to sing Dana International. So this is also a recycling. This is also a resurface of an archive, but it's not necessarily a political meta commentary. It's not taking Dana International and making her into an object language into which the repetition is a meta language commenting on that object language or recycling it. More it's like it is a copying. There's an engagement. There's a sort of blurring of that. And there's a pleasure in it. Um, it's a politics somehow that's not explicitly political in the same way. It's more homage than they tournament. So it felt there's something at work here but not necessarily working in the same way as the artwork it's embedded in. And this came up again um, in Kamal al Jaffa's uh, Jaffa trilogy, particularly um, his film, Port of Memory. 
and you show at length again how he takes two Israeli films, Delta Force with Chuck Norris and a musical Casablan, and then reuses these images to sort of resurface a history of Jaffa before it was destroyed. So again, it's taking the images and sort of using them for new speculative ends. Um, but then there's this one moment of it where you say that he was worried about screening the film in Palestine, in Lebanon, and in Qatar, partly because um, it includes a Hebrew song and he was worried how Arab audiences would take that song. And then to his surprise, there was no, and, and this is a popular song from a kitsch movie that is melodramatic. This is not an artwork. It's something that is based in uh, the popular as such. And, um, and Al Jafari notes, quote, they found the song beautiful and moving and they identify with its lyrics about exile and longing for home. So this is in some sense a text that one could read as a text from a settler colonial state. One could read it in all the ways we would read these sorts of uh, cultural works, but something else is happening here. And you know, them, I mean, you write this, it's precisely here between the ironic quotation and the melancholic translation that Al Jafari citations find their greatest political possibility. So this is you commenting on it. And so I just thought this seems similar to the singing of the songs of Dana International in that there's um, a political work that's coming through, not necessarily through self-conscious resignification or the meta-reflective commenting upon. Um, here there's more of an engagement than a detachment and separation. Melodrama works as melodrama, not as higher. It is through the work of melodrama that something is, is going on. Al Jafari is as aware of this as you are. And so I just wondered then, are we at this point where there's a sort of, um, the popular brings an unstable politics that again, inflects the, the idea of the political that you're working with. Um, and that's the end of my comments. I have another thing, but I think I'll just run way over time <laughs> before I go into it. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So, Devashri, we're on to you. A lot to think about, Gil. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, let me say it's such a privilege and such a pleasure to be part of this wonderful panel and to discuss this beautiful book. Much has already been said, so I think I'm going to just do... Um, my brief to myself was think with the book and just kind of unpack it a little bit for those that might not have encountered it. Um, so I'll start on a light note. If I had to make a t-shirt inspired by the book, it would say this, archives for the future. <laughs> Four words, two exclamation points and an upraised fist. Now the exclamation points would strike a note of optimism and even surprise. And I'm choosing each of these words very carefully while the iconic image of the fist draws on struggles of the past that can be reactivated in the present. I am not sure that Gil will love that t-shirt, but we can talk about that later. But the reason I'm opening with thinking about the making of a thing, a banal thing, is because this is a book essentially about making and doing, about imagining and bringing into being continually, ceaselessly becoming, but not as an end in itself, but as political and ethical praxis of striving towards livable futures. So these are modest futures, livable. And archives, the archival, understood variously and with the many cautions that we have come to expect by now are the material stuff with which we can do this work of becoming. Now, I first read excerpts of Gill's beautiful book in January 2020, in that infamous and epic year, right on the cusp of global lockdowns and mass tragedy. I was in Paris and I was finishing the revisions on my first book. I was in a new city, but I was inhabiting multiple time zones because of a constant barrage of very panicked WhatsApp messages on my phone and disturbing news that was streaming in from India. Two universities in Delhi where I had first learned to think with cinema, Jamia Milia Islamia and Jawaharlal Nehru University had both been violently attacked by the police and various right-wing groups. Hundreds of students were injured and many detained 
Many are still in jail today. Now that experience of living through what felt like impossible times and living in a place that was somehow not really Paris, but a mixture of New Delhi and New York had me on edge. And then I started reading Becoming Palestine. If the pandemic can be a portal to the future, as Arundhati Roy suggests, then the archive can be a portal to the future is what Gil Hochberg tells us. I was struck by the clarity of the thought in this book, the poetry of the expression, and really the, what I think Gayatri has already spoken about, the deep care and commitment to the artworks uh, that is demonstrated on every page. And immediately I found a new language to articulate some thoughts that I had been living with for years, but how to articulate those with the texture of contemporary struggle. So there's a section in my intro that is indirect directly indebted to Becoming Palestine. I'm just going to quote a little bit. Lost films and lost people, irretrievable time and inaccessible sensations. We could think of these as missing and mournable, or we could think of these as those that got away, that evaded the archive. This book is not a project of recovery, I said in my intro, or filling in the gaps with a certain or triumphant knowledge. At the end of it, you will not know the whole history of Bombay cinema, but you will have seen some glimpses of an ongoing struggle, a hustle to become. Um, Gil, I thank you for allowing me to be able to think like that with a lot, with the work that for me was fundamentally an archival work um, that drew obviously on my own experience of practice, but also so much material that had to be activated in the archives. And so we return to the slogan on the t-shirt, archives for the future. In Gill's own words, and I quote, archives for the future are counter hegemonic meta interventions into the political status quo. So this is an urgent call to action and it is resolutely against despair. In times of unceasing crisis, it is critical to keep struggling towards possibility to choose consciously imagination and thus reject consciously fatalism. Becoming Palestine is also resistant to archival recuperations, as you've heard already, mainly because it doesn't believe in the idea of a stable past. What this means is that it is not possible to return to a pristine time or a place of before. As Gil elaborates, and I quote, the process of becoming Palestine obviously requires the unbecoming of Israel as we know it. But at the same time, it is not about becoming Palestine again. Close quotes. Now the idea of return is emotionally very powerful, but has also become entangled with projects of the nation state. Gil is drawing us towards a post-national future where we must imagine new forms of belonging and community of solidarity and love. Of course, as Stuart Hall has reminded us, the past and the desire to return is not a mere phantasm either. It is something. The past continues to speak to us, but this is no longer, no longer a simple factual past. It is always constructed through memory, fantasy, narrative, and myth. Not an essence, but a positioning. And I'm closing the quotes here um, from Stuart Hall. So in a similar vein, Becoming Palestine argues that we must orient ourselves to the past differently. A simplistic yearning for the past and mourning the roads not taken is simply not enough. It could even be, as Gil would have it, detrimental to our present and our future if it leads to stagnation and a perpetual backward glance. At its most polemical then, Becoming Palestine maintains that there is nothing promising in the archive as such. There is nothing left to prove or find. But this is not an argument to do away with archives or to do away with archival struggles. Rather, Gill urges us to do different things with the archive. At least in the context of Palestine, Israel, the truths are already known, but have made little difference. The challenge that Gill poses here is to the serial recuperative returns that somehow always confirm the same narrative. And there is another danger to archival recovery and the logic of excavation. Metaphors of digging that bleed across history, archeology span and psychoanalysis in the belief that a true past will one day be struck. 
The danger is of the theft of decolonial discourse for nationalist revival. Ethno-nationalist macho flexing as we are seeing in India today or more immediately in Russia. At the same time, to abandon the heroic quest for a unitary past does not mean to disavow the fact of history as crime, a very evocative phrase in the book, but restoring a history of crime as a feature of the present. So how then do we approach this past? History traditionally practiced may not be the most viable option, says Gill, with apologies or perhaps no apologies to historians in the room. The past must be animated not through historiographies of causation and explanation, but instead of storytelling, memory making, through embodiment and dance, through touch and singing. And here it is useful to list a few words that one reads over and over again in the book, because they tell us a lot about the shift that Gill is urging. Some of these words are potential, present, activate, playful, alternative, action, imagining. And many of these words are verbs, doing words, words that capture movement and practice, often at the point of emergence. So the new archival imagination that Gill detects in contemporary Palestinian art moves away from the event as a focal point of historiography to emergence as a focal point of artistic practice. And what's at stake here is the question of political change and for potentiality, how to make a better world and from what means. Each of the chapters, as you've heard, has a, makes a very close engagement with different works of art and imagination and gives us different modes of activating archives for the future. And one recurring mode, and I'm thinking here just practically what, what takeaways can we take in terms of possibilities. One mode that recurs is refusal. The refusal of closure, even of interpretation. In Larissa Sansur's futuristic film, Gail is attracted to the film's embrace of bewilderment as an active political muddling. Part of the futility of a historical imagination that's predicated on recovering the past is that there are no more surprises to be had. Either the tools of inquiry are already biased towards a desired discovery, or the new truths discovered just confirm what we already know. Hence, bewilderment becomes an uncanny and a sensory route into the past that is rethought as future. So just towards um, wrapping up, as a scholar of image-based media like film, I have to celebrate and applaud Gill's interest in film and video works. A media scholar cannot by definition be a believer in final truths. We know that images, even photographic images, are fundamentally unstable. They blur and they fade, they pixelate, Mediation means loss and translation, and every frame contains decisions about placement and choreography, inclusion and exclusion. And so in that vein, I want to think with Gil about a film that I saw recently. It's called A Night of Knowing Nothing by Pyle Kapadia. And I know that at least Brian has seen this film. Now it's a film that radically blurs the lines between fiction and documentary in chronicling the political flux of contemporary India. And the film revisits those very months in late 2019 and early 2020 that I was living through in Paris when students across India were being viciously attacked by the BJP government. Much of the film is composed of documentary footage of protests and standoffs, footage from television news and from press conferences. But there is a parallel plot line in which we discover love letters that are supposedly found by the filmmaker. One of my students who had watched the film before I did cautioned me that the love letters are not probably real. They're not really found. I don't think they're an actuality. She cautioned me. But after watching the film, I realized that those letters of love, lovers' complaints and misgivings, attempts to put sensory loss into words, they are the key to the film's affective power. It doesn't matter that the letters are not really real because they so easily might have been. The letters speak of lovers separated by caste, language, politics of food, clothing, politics of touch. 
And this crisis, of course, this crisis of young love is emblematic of everything that is wrong in India today. And even formally, the aesthetic power of the film draws on um, a term from Jamie Barron that Gill also uses a lot, archival effects created by these found letters, switching to black and white, layering contemporary scenes with sonic palimpsests. There is something deeply playful, citational and empathetic here. And I can now name it thanks to Gill as an archival imagination that urges us into new futures of becoming with each other. Because a night of knowing nothing tells me nothing new, nothing fundamentally new, but it still opens up a whole world of possibility. For one thing, it begins and ends with dancing. Gil, I think you will like this film. Um, and I will end there. I, I just had two questions. One was uh, along the lines of Brian's question about the digital and the post-factual, something you discuss in your Larissa Sansor uh, section about what one does with the right wing and a deep fake and conspiracy theory. And the other is simply uh, thinking about what are the limits of the speculative. Um, the speculative is it always already uh, has an ethical potential uh, because there are other, other forms of speculation and futurity that are deeply extractive connected with uh, various forms of financial capitalism and so on. Um, so just, just opening up those two things. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> so much to think about. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, Gil, you're going to have a chance to respond to some of these uh, deep questions, but I wanted to just maybe throw one question from the Q&A in with it because it uh, links up with what Brian was talking about. And so maybe when you talk about um, that uh, issue, uh, this would be helpful. And this is, uh, a question for Dr. Hochberg, uh, so somebody who respects you. Uh, sometimes there are plural counter archives coexisting with each other at any point of the continuous presentness you talked about. Although these are all minority narratives countering status records, they are nonetheless in disjoint with each other. How exactly does one traverse this discordant plurality of counter archives? Um, and uh, should I do one more? Uh, we can try. Well, we're all rushing in. No, I think we better. Um, so yeah, I'll, let me do this. To... I would love to to be able to at least address a, a little bit and then um, to get some of the audience um, responses too. So first of all, to the three of you, Gayatri, Brian, and, and Debashri, um, thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, I uh, listened and I, I I learned a lot from your engagement um, with the book. It's, it's, I took a lot of notes and I will listen again to the recording because it's been remarkably um, helpful for me, really. So I, I did write and I'll try my best to at least touch on some of these. Um, I think that I'll start with Gautry um, in the sense of the tension, Gautry, that you noted between the open secret of the archive and the archive is always harvesting ghosts. Um, so I think, yes, the tension is there. And I, um, I, I suppose that the way I, um, maybe I'll even connect it to your following question, which was about the negative affects or the, the movement in queer studies. I think my attempt to sort of account for both of them is one in the term perceptimism, which isn't mine, but Emil Habibi's term, but I borrow it, uh, which is, you know, it's a very, it, it is, an optimist book, but it's a very pessimistic book about the present, right? So it's sort of almost suggesting that things are so bad that we really have to break away uh, and that the breaking away has to uh, take place in a form that um, is more radical than um, recovery um, because the recovery is already sort of too enmeshed in this catastrophic present. Um, in terms of the Kind of the 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 question of the um, those traces of the past. What I um, hope to emphasize through these works is that all of these works highlight um, a kind of, you know, even the return to unveiling or in or or unsurfacing these ghosts take place through the privileging of 
the copy, the non-authentic, the mask, the actual mask, right? Uh, as in the the uh, the work of uh, Basel uh, uh, Abbas in, in um, uh, Abu Rahim, which is uh, you know sort of running around with three uh, D copy masks of archaeological Neolithic masks that are shown in the Israeli archive of the archaeological museum, right? So it's the privileging of the non-authentic, the mask, um, the imitation, the recitation. Uh, and in fact, even, you know, what is it that, for example, in Earl Jeffrey's films that we touched on, what he does is not just, um, he doesn't just reveal figures of Palestinians that are already in the films. He actually, it, that's not sufficient, right? I mean, he actually places his uncle digitally over and within the Palestinian, uh, the sorry, the Israeli f popular film Casablanca, right? So it's, it's, I think all of these works are suggesting that finding traces is not not important, but is not sufficient, or it's not sort of a, a invigorating enough for a creating of a new vision. So I hope that is um, somewhat of uh, addressing this. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Brian, uh, you, I'm sorry, I'm sort of reading my very incoherent notes here, but in terms of, cause I was really focusing, Brian, I think your question about the, um, the popular uh, is, is really brilliant. It's sort of, I, I did not think about it in those terms and I actually will because I think there's something very interesting even in terms of the genre because all of these works are, you know, they're, they're um, kind of biennale works in the sense that these are, you know, the avant-garde kind of art, not, not popular. And there is actually in almost all of them an incorporation of the popular. And I have not thought about that at all. So I think this is something I, I really thank you for. Um, and I, I will sort of think about this more. I already am starting to think about how there is a kind of... Um, recitation that really is about pleasure and therefore and and here i think that you know it ties to all of your questions because i think that idea of generating pleasurable affect uh in the sort of even in the meeting of the ghostly matters of the archive is something that these works are committed to i would think further about the place of the um of the popular in here because especially in this uh shuruk harb's film that you give the example for what is remarkable is that is the only scene in the film where her sister dances with and against the background of dana international and it's an overtly celebratory moment in a very dark narrated film. Um, so um, it, there's just a lot to think about what it is. And I thank you, I did not think about this. Sort of like, it's almost like the creeping in of the popular into the Biennale moment. Uh, so I really think that's important. Also in terms of a commentary on art and, and the Institute of Art, right? So I, it's, it's wonderful. I, I will run with this, so thank you. Um, to your other question, which is very important, partially actually, uh, uh, Debashri made the um, partial answer to it, which is that I, uh, your, your question about the historical archive and whether it's exhausted its possibility. Um, I think it's it it is not obviously not, and I think that you know I I am not suggesting in the book that it isn't. What I am suggesting is that the um, that the historical meaning the discipline of history capital H um, monopoly of the archive or how we read archives or what we do the archives that that is that needs to do that we that I can happily say we need to do away with not just because there are other disciplines but because it really does. Um, um, uh, limit the the ways we encounter, approach, experience the world, and um, I think that it's it, it's that that's that was my main point was uh, was that I do think that of course there is place uh, as we see for um, you know historical uh, documents, especially I would say really on a kind of level that you know it's sort of like the difference between 
freedom and freedom in the liberal state, right? So freedom legally or the release of goods and, and, and art work, et cetera, absolutely. They, they, you know, they, they gain their um, legal sort of in, uh, um, power through these archival um, citations. But at the deeper level of imagining beyond the permissible, that is a place that the historical archive just, or the historical approach to the archive just cannot really help us. In fact, it by de facto, it uh, limits us because it must create that gap between past and present. And it must tell us where the archive begins and ends, right? And so we, it, 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 it's committed to this process of digging, which in the book, I also, you know, show how explicitly, of course, in the case of Palestine, the 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 digging, the archaeological digging, uh, uh, is a very much uh, a very material and, and and present day interruption with the present day, right? With the lives of Palestinians, uh, with the with the present, with the fact that the present in itself is an archive. We don't need to dig into that present in order to find another. So part of my arguments, I think, are sp specifically tuned to, um, to Palestine as a, as a study case. Uh, and just on this note, I will just add um, that one of the, the things that are in that sense different is that there is something, I think it's true for all cases, but in the case of Palestine, because the history of the state of Israel uh, is uh, very short. And the history of Palestine cannot be written because it already is kind of an oriental object, right? So we have a oriental figure that nobody knows where it begins and where it ends that is called the history of Palestine. And then you have the uh, uh, state archive or the state narrative of 1948, et cetera. You have sort of a large morph unknown history versus a um, excessively archived history. And it also creates the solution that we really need this archive. 74 years is not a past, it's a present, right? So the present of Palestine is present. That's why one can go as some of the artists do and collect um, uh, flowers and stones. And that is the archive, right? That is the archive, that's the archive of the present. There is something in the very, call to continuously dig into a past that actually uh, uh, creates a uh, uh, another kind of speculative reality or what I call through censors reading the the archival imagination of Zionism is as science fiction as the you know any kind of artistic uh, speculation of of the future uh, the question is here, which of these speculations will gain our attention? Um, and then um, finally, uh, Deborah Shri, uh, such a, a beautiful reading um, as always. And, uh, you know, all the, though I, I, you know, I, there was a, a, a reason why all four of you are, are, are here. I, you know, I, your work is very dear and close to me. Um, I uh, would say, Debashree, that you are right on with sort of paying attention or really calling attention or driving everybody's attention to this, the power of the affective power. And what I would say about this is that, um, uh, and I will definitely look at this film that you recommended, but that what I would say is that because facts, um, and not just in our post-factual time, uh, but facts, um, um, they, 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 they don't necessarily, they, because they are facts and not, they do not necessarily generate affect. I don't think they have a great ethical or lasting political impact. Uh, but activization of facts, uh, the uh, affect power of re-engaging facts, archives of any kind, that is, I think, where, um, where, where change um, lies. So I know it was short, but I think that's the best I can do under the time limits. And thank you so much. And I'm really happy to get a few questions from the audience.
Uh, well, I think we only have like two minutes for that. So I just wanted to um, say uh, the directions and actually they're very interesting. Um, one is about archives uh, and archival labor. And I think you don't have time to answer that, but it's very interesting sort of where people got these archives, where these artists got these archives and what that labor is. It's not, I think, been your project. But I think it's something really important to raise. And the other question that seems to tie in that actually picks up on your, you know, the recognition that you're talking about Biennale kinds of works. And Brian, I think, really nicely brought in, you know, the, the way the popular uh, jumps into these. But this question was about a different temporality of um, thinking about. Palestinian cultural practices that look to the past while carrying and adapting present practices into the present, but um, it's Amanda Batarse, and sort of asking about folk and popular traditions, which have been adapted to meet the needs of popular resistance now. So they're cultural practices, which you're interested in making, as Dave Rashri says, you know, making things, but this isn't what the artists that you're talking about are doing and yet all of this is going on in confusing the temporality in other spheres that are perhaps a little more popular so i don't know i say it's 7 30 and i think we we're supposed to stop then but if you wanted to have one word on either of those i just wanted to make sure they right. got so, heard thank oh you. there's um, more uh oh, oh thank you Sarah Cole also has something. Thank you for the wonderful book. We have to, we have to hear Sarah Cole. Yeah, we have to. I, it was lower down on my screen. Uh, I find your futurist affect to be very appealing. Can we think of this project more broadly? And if we do, what do we need to make sure not to miss? In other words, in looking forward, how do we retain the specificity and nuance of these works and archives? And so I guess it's a question about broadening this beyond Palestine and what's happening there um interesting so i think i don't know if you want one last word i am, I am willing to, to all of this. answer i just don't want people to feel you know and, and i will also you know whoever wants uh it's very easy to find my email and i will um uh, happily engage in a conversation nobody there's not a single person who does not want to engage in a conversation about their own work so uh i i would love that uh very very quickly i will say first that in terms of the other practices of course uh, my um I, I think that there's something that I do mention in the book. There's this is a group specifically that I mean not a group. There's they're not a group of people, but the I was interested in a, in something that I saw as a particular political moment in a particular generation. Um, that actually I think also uh, the context for the art practices is actually very much a response to a previous generation, which um, I. Uh, kind of accounted to in terms of Said's um, call to the right to narrate. My understanding of these art practices is a kind of refusal, as uh, uh, Bashri mentioned, refusal to narrate, and not because there is a refusal of the past or, or, or a rejection of past traditions, but there is a certain refusal of being in a position uh, as an artist, as a young person, as a person who thinks, as a, in, uh, et cetera, of being tied to a committed uh, right to narrate um, and being tied to a position of either victimhood or accountability of a certain past. And what I found was that there is, and I also found it in the, um, not just in the artwork, but in many of the conversations, I had many uh, interviews with uh, each one of these artists, that there was really a kind of a, um, a demand to have the right to imagine. And in that sense, very much so the right of Palestinian artists to join the biennales of the 21st century uh, and not be uh, recognized time and again for one position, telling the story of the Nakba. Uh, and it was, uh, I think, very important for all of these artists. And I think it's important not just because, oh, it's the art world, but because um, uh, uh, the place of a full liberated subjectivity, so to speak, also has to do with a certain uh, right that is beyond just what Arendt tells us, the right to have rights. The rights to have rights is not enough. The rights to imagine is what um, I think 
all of these artists uh, uh, want to take part in. So that's my account, and I'm not, of course, dismissing other practices, but this was in this sense. Um, in terms of um, Sarah Cole, uh, or Dean Cole's question, uh, um, I, I do actually in the book uh, open it up to other contexts. I can't do justice uh, doing it right now. I think there are things that are specific to Palestine, uh, and that is because, let me mention a few things very quickly. The time frame uh, for a settler colonial project, Palestine is a different case than other cases because uh, the, the time frame is an extended present. I insist in the book that there is no past. There is an extended present. The Nakba happened, it's happening, it's continuing to happening. So what we have is a present. We, there is no place to talk here about reparation. There is a place to talk about return. And the return, I opened the book with it, is a return that inherently I think it has to be speculative because, uh, because imagining Palestine before is no longer even in those territorial um, uh, divisions that we will accept as a state of Palestine today, right? I mean, that's sort of a, a bigger uh, uh, idea. But um, so one, there's, it's an extended present of settler colonialism that is just, you know, that has a present and, 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 and hopefully not a future as these works are suggesting. Um, and, um, um, and because um, there is a particular, um, power to Zionism as a, as a political modality that I think uh, some of these artists, especially uh, Larissa Sansur, whose project I think is about this, has the, the, the characteristics of a successful science fiction, right? So uh, we have to learn what is so successful about science fiction if we're going to replace this order, uh, uh, you know, and we have to learn how to read it. Um, Unfortunately, in our world, and this is back to Sarah Cole's question, our world is becoming more and more science fiction, right? So I think that we can absolutely learn what we need to start learning is to pay attention to how to read our reality and learn to read it really as science fiction and then approaches as such. And that we will not learn in the Department of History. That we will learn in media studies, in comparative literature, in uh, engagements with art, etc. So that's what I think needs to be done. We need to pay attention to um, to uh, cultural engagement that actually is moving ahead with the present to teach us how to li live this present that is. Um, exceeding our our ways of of thinking about it. it it's it's a science fiction that is becoming more and more fictive and speculative as we breathe, as we move. So we cannot just go back to the dusty archive and find a some either explanation or a, a theological reason for it. We're not there anymore. We we really are not. So that would be my answer to what we need to do. And we will give you the last word for that uh, with science fiction. I want to thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian, Gayatri, uh, Devashri. Thank and you so much. You know, most of all for the book. Thank you, Lila. For this amazing discussion. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for attending.